Welcome to my channel. I don't know if one of these probably 100 Hyperloop debunkers has ever addressed what this will be about, but I don't think so. So let's do the maybe 100th Hyperloop debunk video. By the way, I'm not going to mention Elon Musk a lot because he's pretty much out of this whole thing. This is about someone else's project named Hyperloop One, which is a maglev train in a vacuum and it's not the one from the original white paper with that turbo compressor thing in front, which was not a great idea for a number of reasons. They scrapped it, so I'm not going into this. Anyway, according to the specs, these pods are designed to travel at high subsonic speed up to 745 miles per hour, 1200 kilometers per hour or 333 meters per second. I went and checked some numbers and I found just by inquiring basic gas kinetics, this is going to be much more of a mess than I expected. Firstly, above around 0.7 Mach, you will inevitably have local supersonic flows, but I will not speculate how this would be like for a pod moving in a tube, and I'll skip that. So here we have a Hyperloop tube from San Francisco to Los Angeles that is 560 kilometers long, 348 miles. It's been a nice night in California, and our tube has a temperature of 288 Kelvin. That is 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Pressure is exact to specs at 100 Pascal. That's some weird number in PSI. Compared to somewhat more than 100,000 Pascal of standard atmospheric pressure, Air density is 1.21 gram per cubic meters, and I'm not going to convert this to ounces per cubic yards. The speed of sound in these conditions is 340 meters per second, 1115 feet per second, and 340 meters per second seems familiar. It's a well-known number, to me, maybe to you, but we have only a pressure of 100 Pascal. So why is that? Let's double the pressure, and of course density also doubles, if the temperature stays the same and it's still 340 meters per second. It seems changing the pressure has no effect on the speed of sound. Let's have a look at this formula. You see the pressure is in the numerator and density is in the denominator, and both terms double linearly, so any change evens out and the speed of sound does not change, as long as the temperature does not change. The 1.4 term is kind of a correction factor that is used for air. It's called heat capacity ratio. It's reasonably well explained on Wikipedia. Okay, now the sun is up, it's 1 p.m. and our Hyperloop tube is getting hot from the sun and I'd say 343 Kelvin would be realistic, that's 70 degrees Celsius or 150 degrees Fahrenheit. What's happening inside the tube? If you heat up gas in a closed vessel, the pressure will rise. At 343 Kelvin we will get 119 Pascal, if it's an ideal gas. That's 19 Pascal more than we had in the morning, seemingly no big deal. The speed of sound will increase to 371 meters per second, because temperature is the only parameter affecting the speed, as we have learned. This will be just fine, because if our pod is going at its maximum designed speed of 333 meters per second at 343 Kelvin, that is 0.9 Mach, and we are still subsonic. All going great so far, but now it's afternoon and thunderstorms are passing through, cooling down a short section of 15 kilometers, roughly 10 miles, from 343 Kelvin back to 288 Kelvin. The cooling will happen quite fast because water cooling is very effective, the steel is directly exposed to the weather and the very thin air inside contains not much energy in a given volume. As the temperature drops back to 288 Kelvin by the laws of physics, the pressure also drops back to 100 Pascal. That means the temperature change has now created a low pressure zone inside the tube, and from both sides now air starts flowing from the high pressure zone towards the low pressure zone. Now there's something interesting about the flow in low density gases. The lower the density, the faster the gas will flow. I found this little formula that allows to roughly calculate the flow speed for low pressure differences and I get 177 meters per second, that's 582 feet per second. That means if the pod is in the right spot, or in the wrong spot, whatever, and it's heading into this fast airflow, the speeds add up and that would cause the pod to move supersonic all of a sudden. Subsonic might already cause problems, but supersonic is even worse. I'll show later why. If you want to keep it subsonic, in my example, you'd have to lower the speed to less than half of its normal travel speed until you've passed the flow. In real life, you will have a constantly changing weather inside the tube with high and low pressure zones, depending on the ever-changing weather conditions outside. It's a complete mess in my eyes. 
To counter that, you would have to measure these flows in real time and decide fast what you do with your pods. Before I get to the supersonic ride, I'll have a look at the problems of a regular boring subsonic ride along the tube with 100 Pascal in the entire tube. First, I want to be sure it's still a gas at 100 Pascal and not an actual vacuum. Let's see. The main parameter to look at is the mean free path of the air molecules. If the mean free path length is getting close to the size of our object, it would become kind of hard to justify the use of middle school textbook physics. And as we see, the mean free path is just below 100 micrometers. And I think that's small enough compared to the size of our pod to say our medium will act like a gas and so we can use the known laws of gas kinetics. Our pod starts its journey and we have air in front of it. A dynamic pressure is building up because the air gets accelerated to the speed of the pod. And inevitably not all of the air is getting behind the pod because there's a big opening right in front where the air is pushed along the tube. The resistance of the big opening is much lower than the resistance in these narrow gaps between the pod and the tube. The compressed air gets pushed into these gaps and it will never go faster than the local speed of sound, no matter how high the pressure gets. That's a natural limit of gas flows and that's why the gas speed never exceeds the speed of sound in the intake of a De La Waal nozzle. Of course, the mass flow will increase as the pressure rises, but the speed will always be the speed of sound which itself depends only on temperature. It's like these gaps between the pods and the tube are clogged up with pressurized air, or it's a bottleneck, if you will. By the way, why is the front shape like that? The pressure will cause an uneven force pushing the front of the pod down to the rail. I don't know why they did this. Are they ignorant or am I missing something? Anyway, I think it's safe to assume that more, really much more than half of the gas remains in front of the pod and moves along with it in the tube. As the pod travels, more and more gas is added to that moving cushion of gas and because the pod is subsonic, the pod is lagging behind the initial impulse and the cushion expands forward and the pressure increases. The temperature also increases, but as the gas is very thin, I don't think that would be a problem at this point. All of this even has a name and it's kind of well researched. It's called the piston effect and given the narrow clearance between the pod and the tube, it has to be taken into consideration. In tunnels, it causes air to get sucked into the tunnel entrance behind the vehicle. In our closed tube, it will lower the pressure behind the pod. I'm not trying to calculate real numbers. There's just too many parameters I only could guess. The growing air cushion is reaching the LA station maybe 50 kilometers before the pod arrives. And the pressure wave is getting reflected back to the pod and then back again and back again and so on. The pressure will rise quickly and also it heats up faster. I still don't think the rising temperature is critical. Maybe within the last kilometers this could cause a problem for the pod casing. But then the pod is already starting to slow down, allowing the pressure to equalize. But again, there's that problem with the high pressure zone. This time a few hundred or even a few thousand pascal discharging to the back of the pod, causing gas to flow back into the tube at a high speed. Maybe to avoid too much pressure build up, one could try and add some sort of a pressure relief pipe to bypass the pod and let the gas flow back into the tube. But opening this bypass again would just cause a wave of gas flowing backwards at a very high speed. All of this is not addressed yet, at least to my knowledge, and I consider this a major unsolved problem of Hyperloop 1. Now a view on what probably happens when the pod goes supersonic. Again, a cushion of pressurized air is bulking up in front of the pod, but this time it can't escape the vicinity of the pod because the pod is moving at the cushion's speed limit, which is the speed of sound. The cushion stays in front of the pod and extends somewhat ahead because it's heating up, increasing its internal speed of sound. The exact length of that cushion is impossible to tell because it depends on its temperature, which is impossible to calculate because of the unknown amount of heat dissipating to the steel tubes and the unknown amount of gas passing to the back of the pod. But anyway, it means all the energy that gets transferred into that cushion stays in a small volume and establishes a shock wave. If this was an airplane, the air could just flow around the surfaces at supersonic speed, causing a lot of waves that are spreading freely around the plane. Since the pod is in a tube and there's just a small clearance around it, the shockwave can't really discharge around the body of the pod. I don't think there were many experiments conducted to investigate what happens exactly, but it's pretty safe to say it will turn into a gas kinetics mess. 
roughly estimated the port test to displace 3.4 kg of air each second, and at supersonic speed a great part of that air will remain in the shockwave area in front of it. Now, if we slow down the pod to subsonic, the shockwave will travel away at the speed of sound, and if we are close enough to the station, most of it will travel to the tube's end, probably causing a noticeable effect and get reflected back and collide with our pod. Again, it's hard to predict what this will look like and what will happen, but I feel like this is something that you would really like to avoid. Maybe someone could come up with all sorts of ideas and contraptions to counter that, but it seems a big problem which has not been addressed yet, at least to my knowledge. Okay, that's my little Hyperloop debunk. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching.